The madness of the NCAA tournament is almost over. We've got you covered from around the country. This is Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown. I'm Kanali Stevens. Thank you for joining us in this special bracket breakdown preview where we look ahead to the men's and the women's final four. This bonus episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more and visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Andy Patton and Isaac Shade from Locked On College Basketball and Alex Donald from Locked On Canes are here to talk to us about the national perspective. And then, of course, we take it to the local perspective because that's what we do here at Locked On. We are going to start out with that heavyweight matchup between UConn and Miami. Andy, your team was the latest victim of UConn. Um, obviously, the Gonzaga just, uh, just ran into, you know, a buzzsaw, as you want to yeah. say. Is In your mind, is UConn the team to beat after what you saw from your team facing off against them? 100%. Yeah, and, and I think that they might have been beforehand. Uh, certainly a, a absolute demolition of a very good offensive team in Gonzaga definitely helps, uh, helps the case there. And, and this is a team that came in with – with a fair amount of momentum, they didn't win the Big East tournament, but they played very well. They had been playing well as of late. They had a really bad stretch in the middle of the season. I, I think they lost six of eight kind of coming into Big East play. But really, before that and after that, they've been fantastic. Like, if you remove that stretch of games, they are one of the best teams in all of college basketball. And they are playing like it right now. I know they didn't have to play a one seed in Kansas, but what they did to Arkansas, combined with what they did to Gonzaga, even St. Mary's and Iona, like, this is a team that's that's rolling right now and, and Miami is going to be a really really tough challenge for them no doubt uh, very good guard play there but to me UConn looks like the best team still remaining but the best team still remaining has not been the team that has won all that often so definitely right. not a guarantee this is the year of the upset obviously Alex you know Miami loves to play that underdog role and they've kind of been the underdog so to say for a couple of these games despite the fact they made it to the elite eight last year they have mm -hmm. a very veteran team how much has that benefited them how much will that help against a UConn team where you know if you're a younger team you don't have that experience maybe you're out of it a lot earlier than you would like to be but Miami's battled back in some of these tough matchups the experience is everything. I mean, to have uh, a guy like Isaiah Wong with an extra year of experience compared to last year, he struggles with inconsistency sometimes, but when he's on, he's on, and it's why he was the ACC player of the year. Uh, and then adding in the transfer portal the way that Miami did, I mean, to add Nigel Pack and Norchad Omier, who have both been incredibly valuable this season, to go along with a good nucleus and seeing Wuga Poplar improve as much as he has uh, this year, uh, there's no doubt in my mind Miami is a better team than they were a year ago. I mean, they were, you know, you talk about them being underdogs throughout this tournament. They were really underdogs throughout last year's tournament to make that run to the Elite Eight. Uh, so this is, a, this is a mature team and someone we talked about a lot, Kai, the last time we were on together. Uh, I believe Jordan Miller is the glue that holds this whole thing together. He was the headline maker in that comeback win against Texas. It was just a weird stat line to think Miami could win that game when Texas was shooting lights out from three and Miami couldn't hit a three. Well, they hit two of them, but they effectively couldn't hit a three in that game, but they were able to get back in it uh, basically through free throw shooting, some clutch two point baskets down the stretch. And with Jordan Miller basically having a perfect night, I mean, seven for seven from the floor, 13 for 13 from the free throw line that hadn't been done since Christian Leitner did that 31 years ago. So you're going to need more, a lot more of that uh, against UConn. But no, there's there's no doubt in my mind this is a better team, a more potent team, and a more mature team than they were a year ago. Isaac, I want to bring you in and talk a little bit about the coaching in this Final Four matchup because Dan Hurley and Jim Laranega could probably not be much more different if you tried. Obviously, Hurley's so fiery. He just gets, gets right in there and is just – I don't know. He's his own little entity. And Jim Laranegas had so much success. He's calm, cool, and collected in all situations. I just feel like he has everything under control, even if it's not. Um, stylistically, is there an edge to either of them? Obviously, Jim Laranega has been there before many years ago with George Mason. Do you see one having an edge over another? Well, in, in terms of that, Kai, I think that's a massive part of it. There is the been there, done that nature of it for Jim Laraniega, who was back in 2006 with George Mason and one of the craziest final four runs we have ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's been a minute, right? Like, mm -hmm. as, as we were talking about, this is Miami's first two times in program history being to the Elite Eight and now beyond. 
But I think that experience has to play a pivotal role in this. However, keep in mind, even though Danny Hurley uh, is only, uh, you know, ha- doesn't have as many years as Jim Laranega does, think about his pedigree with his dad and everything he's done with his brother, Bobby, who is the head coach at Arizona State, who won back-to-back national championships at Duke. So even though he doesn't quite have the pedigree, like, for example, this is Danny Hurley's first time making it past the first weekend of the tournament. Mm -hmm. I would say that Jim Laranega personally holds the edge, but I would say that family pedigree kind of helps Danny Hurley come back up and even the playing field a little bit. Alex, obviously, I'm sure Jim Laranega will have a game plan, that very detailed one going into this game. And with the experience that they have, the veteran experience, having gone to the Elite Eight last season, what are they going to need to do to try to get the Huskies off balance, who looked so dominant in every level of the tournament thus far, to try and give themselves a chance and then hopefully make the championship game? Yeah, well, the Huskies have so much firepower, as we've seen throughout the tournament. So uh, if Miami's going to win this game, and I think they can, uh, but they're going to have to win it a different way than they beat Texas. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to be sharper shooting from beyond the arc. Uh, We know Miami's capable of that because prior to not being able to shoot threes uh, against Texas, they shot all the threes against Houston. So they're they're capable of turning that on. I think Andy was the one who mentioned Mm -hmm. Miami's guard play uh, is Mm -hmm. excellent, you know, Mm -hmm. with what – by Isaiah Wong is capable of doing. So I think that that's a big thing. You've got to hit more threes. You've probably got to be in the double digit range and three point shots made in this one, similar to the Houston game. And I think probably the most important thing, because it's such a, a wild card and X factor is uh, you've got to try and keep Norchad Omir out of foul trouble. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that, that really affected his minutes. Uh, uh, it ended up Jim Laranega took a gamble in the first half of that game because he picked up his first foul really quickly. And then Coach L put him on the bench for a long stretch. And people are watching it like, well, he only has one foul. He should be out there. But Coach L's strategy was we're going to need him a lot more in the second half mm-hmm. than we need him in the first half. And he played for most of that second half on four fouls. So it was, you know, walking a tightrope there. So he's they, they've got to they've got to keep him out of foul trouble. And I think that's something UConn's going to try to exploit because mm-hmm. certainly Texas did like they're going to try to attack him a lot to get him into foul trouble, you know, before the final important minutes uh, of that game happen. So I, I think keeping him out of foul trouble is key. And then. For a lot of the other guys, I just think keep doing uh, what you're doing. You know, you're going to have to have Bensley Joseph step up. He's going to be a really important piece of this. And obviously, Isaiah Wong has to cook. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think something we've seen from Miami throughout the season and throughout the tournament is they're capable of winning in a number of different ways, right? They're, they're, they're capable of kind of attacking you and exploiting you. And I think that says a lot just about how wise and experienced Jim Laranega is. Uh, that he's able to find different ways to attack opposing teams. So I'm I'm really anxious and curious to see how this plays out, right? Because hopefully it's going to be a close competitive game. So what weaknesses in UConn, if there are any, can Jim Laranega exploit? I'm excited too. I feel like it's going to be the game of the weekend. You know, it's almost like the championship before the championship. Don't want to take anything away from that, but it really feels like it um, on paper, at least. Um, in terms of predictions, what do we have? Let's talk about who we have in this game and then whether or not you think that team – will take home the championship. So Andy, we'll start with you. Yeah, I first of all, I do think the winner of this game will take home the championship. And quite honestly, I thought that the winner of the UConn-Gonzaga game would take home the championship, which means I'm going to stick with that and stick with UConn in this one. Uh, I think there's absolutely a path to a victory for Miami. Dono laid it out extremely well right there, but uh, it, a lot of things have to go right. And while I think a lot of them will, uh, UConn is, is so, so tough. And I think they're going to advance here. Isaac, what kind of game are we going to see this weekend between these two, and who do you have? For me, this is a matchup of UConn's strength in the front court with uh, those big dudes, Adama Sinogo (laughs) and Donovan Klingon, the seven foot two freshman against the undersized center in Norchad O'Meara at 6'7. But do not overlook Norchad O'Meara, who will rip an offensive rebound away from (laughs) anyone. Miami's going to have to come up with some kind of junky defensive scheme to stop those guys on the interior, but Miami has the advantage in the backcourt and on the wing with Jordan Miller, Nigel Pack, and of course, Isaiah Wong. I think that they will win some there, but ultimately UConn prevails because of what they can do in the post. And historically, Ken Palm numbers tell us that UConn is the only team with the chance of winning this national championship. If you want to know more about what I mean by that, come check us out on Locked On College Basketball. 
We love the stats. We love it, Isaac. Um, Alex, are you going with the Hurricanes? Are you going to do a reverse jinx and try to pick UConn to get them in, or what? what's your strategy here? Yeah, well, okay, so everything uh, that Andy and Isaac just said, extremely well thought out, but it just went in one ear and out the other for me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I already laid out the blueprint for Miami to win, so why would I not assume they're going to follow it? They're going to follow the blueprint. They're going to win. And then what I'm, what I'm hoping for, because it would be – a lot of fun where I live, and it would mm-hmm. probably piss a lot of people off nationally mm-hmm. if you can get the all South Florida final, right? I mean, if you oh, get yeah. FAU, you know, about what 45, 50 miles up the road uh, versus mm-hmm. Miami in the championship round. I mean, you know, the ratings would be through the roof between Boca Raton and Miami. Out uh, of mm-hmm. the rest of the country, would probably not be too happy about <laughs> that, but I'd love to see that kind of chaos in the final. South I Beach love- versus the retirement community. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I love that for you. The beach town battle. Let's do it. Um, coming up in uh, our second segment, we're going to go over that other game, of course, San Diego State and FAU. So Andy and Isaac are going to stick around for that. Alex, thank you for joining us. Thanks. March Madness is almost over, but now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get that no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. You just have to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is super safe, secure, and easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes that are drained. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Welcome back to our final four bracket breakdown preview. I'm Kainani Stevens, Andy Patton, and Isaac Shade from Locked On College Basketball are back with us for our second segment here. We've covered that huge uh, heavyweight matchup between Miami and UConn. Now we have to go to the other side of the bracket. Some of the underdog stories, so to say, everybody loves a Cinderella, San Diego State, and Florida Atlantic. So let's talk a little bit about the success of these mid-major programs. FAU goes from never having won a tournament game to now heading to their first ever Final Four. Isaac, how has FAU been able to be so successful in this tournament so far and have such such a successful season as a whole, I should say? Well, and and let's not forget, San Diego State is the first Mountain West team to ever make an Elite Eight or a Final Four. So it's both teams Mm -hmm. in this matchup. But for FAU... They are so fun to watch. I hope everyone saw that game against K-State last weekend, man. They just get up and down the court. They run like crazy. You've got guys like like Elijah Martin, who Mm -hmm. is able to dunk like crazy on Mm -hmm. one play and then rain threes over you on the next. So it's just a Mm -hmm. very fun team that, by the way, has one and one and one and one. I don't care what conference or what level you play at. If you know how to win basketball games – you know how to win basketball games. And so it, it's really uh, an incredible thing for college basketball. I know a lot of people will talk about, hey, we want to see the Blue Bloods, and we absolutely do. But what a weird contrast. Like last year, we had four schools called, oh, I don't know, Duke and Carolina and Kansas and Villanova. And then this year, we have this whole other crop of teams in a different kind of playing field. You know, I mean, you could argue for UConn, but you get my point. And so. Yeah. Uh, I think it's awesome and fun. I know the TV execs are probably like (laughs) wringing sweat out of their shirts because of it, but man, it's so fun. And let's keep in mind, these are not Cinderella stories. All four of these teams are ranked top 22 in Ken Palm in Miami. The lone power five school is the lowest ranked out of the quartet. It's awesome for our sport. Come on. (laughs) Let's do it. Andy, let's talk a little about about all those winning teams. Obviously, San Diego State out of the Mountain West. They've done things Mountain West we've never seen do before. Um, is it that winning culture on these smaller teams that allows them to be successful in tournament time? They they are winning. They're used to winning, right? So they're not going into this thing. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. They're thinking, hey, we want to keep winning, and that allows them to get to the level. Winning and experience are the the two critical things for San Diego State. Brian Dutcher, in his six seasons with Aztecs, he's won 76% of the games that he has coached. (laughs) Mountain West, it's not a Power 5 conference. It's one of the best non-Power 6 conferences out there. Uh, A lot of teams that make the tournament every single year, yes, they don't perform particularly well in the tournament. San Diego State also challenges themselves in the non-conference as good as most, if not all, mid-major programs, and, and they've won 76% of their games. So this is a team that, like like Isaac said, talked about Florida Atlantic, they know how to win. They have a culture of players who are used to winning, who expect to win, who go into games thinking, we can win this basketball game. So when they go up against Alabama, you're right, they're, they're not just happy to be there. They expect that they can win that game. And then we talk about the experience. This is the 21st most experienced team in the entire country. Four of their 
uh, five starters all started together last year. So they have familiarity with each other. The newcomers, Darion Trammell, he's been a, a critical piece of what they have done this season. He's a very experienced guy, having spent two years at CLU in the WAC. Uh, they have multiple five-year guys uh, playing significant minutes for them. Matt Bradley, of course, Nathan Mensa, Adam Seiko, all five-year guys. So you're looking at a roster of players who have done this before, have done this at a winning level before, uh, and finally broke through in the tournament in a way that we hadn't seen, like Isaac said, we hadn't seen a Mountain West school do this at all. But once they kind of, once they broke the streak, once they won a few games and kind of kind of broke the ice, you could start to feel like, oh, hey, we belong here. Like, we're not just a team who wins a lot of games in the regular season. We can do it at this level. And I think having a team full of really experienced players really has put them in a good spot to, uh, to be where they are right now. Yeah, these teams certainly don't look lucky or happy to be there. Like they're there to compete and compete seriously against these other programs. Isaac, stylistically, what kind of game are we going to get in this final four matchup? San Diego State can lock you down if they have to. Obviously, FAU loves to shoot that ball. Um, what are we going to expect to see who's going to win and kind of dictate the style of play in this? Well, that's a great question. It's interesting. Florida Atlantic is the more balanced team offensively and defensively with both uh, offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency being top 30 in the nation at Ken Palm, while San Diego State is a little bit more of a tilted scale. They are the fourth best defense in the nation, not just like amongst mid-majors, all 363 teams of Division I, but that offense ranks 75th. And so San Diego State is going to do what they always do. They're going to try to lock you down as best as they possibly can. FAU is going to try to get out and run and run and run. And like you said, shoot and shoot and shoot. But here's the thing. For folks like a team you're probably more familiar with is like a Virginia. Tony mm -hmm. Bennett's team, like a, a team, it's so much easier to slow a team down than speed a team up. So advantage San Diego State. In that aspect, I think they're going to be able to get into Florida Atlantic, bother them a lot. Uh, they've got pickpockets. They've got rim protection from Mensa, as Andy talked about. And so I think it's going to be a close game. And I know we're not quite to picks yet, but I think ultimately that San Diego defense, the San Diego State defense and their ability to control the tempo is what I'm watching for. All right, Isaac, we're, we're going to do picks. So why don't you tell us where exactly you think San Diego can do it and, and make it to the championship game? Well, I do think that San Diego State's defense, I think that's ultimately too much to overcome. They are balanced. They've Matt Bradley is the only player on this team averaging double digits, but they've got eight dudes who average at least six points a game. They run a whole multitude of players at you. Nine players average 16 or more minutes a game. I think that depth, along with how, how fiercely they will guard, ultimately gets Brian Dutcher to the national championship game. Okay. Andy, are you sticking with the Mountain West as well? Or are you going to go with the FAU Cinderella? Not Cinderella because they win all the time, but I like to call Cinderella because I like them. But um, are they going to keep going? I'm going with FAU uh, because I think Isaac makes great points, but Thank you. FAU wiped a lot of those points away by beating Tennessee. Tennessee, a better defensive team than San Diego State, a more physical team than San Diego State, not quite as experienced necessarily, but I think had probably higher level athletes on that squad yes they were missing zakai ziegler and yes they're not a very good offensive team but neither is san diego state there are some similarities in those two teams and it would have been fascinating to see those teams potentially play each other tennessee and san diego state because i think there are some similarities there but for me fau has the blueprint on how to win a game like this. Now, San Diego State obviously has won some massive games, and for them to take down a team like Alabama or even a team like Creighton, quite honestly, uh, proves that they, you know, they belong here and they, and they have been playing some fantastic basketball. But FAU, a little bit more balanced offensively and defensively. Uh, the three-point shooting is going to be the biggest factor in this game. San Diego State holds opposing teams to like 27% from three, I believe it is. Uh, obviously, Florida Atlantic shoots much, much, much better than that. So that's kind of your what's going to give. What's going to Who's going to win this battle? For me, Florida Atlantic has proven they can beat the best defensive team in the country. I think that means they can do it against one of the best defensive teams in the country and advance to a national championship. All right, we'll see. I think... I'm hoping San Diego State makes that bar because I definitely have UConn going to the championship game. And I feel like that defense is something that could get the Huskies off balance and would make for a better mm -hmm. game. Um, so personally, I'm hoping for that just for fan's sake as in terms of watching. But we will have to watch because, as we know, this year, as of many, like, as more than any other year, I feel like is just 
we have no idea what's going to happen. So we will have to check that out. Andy and Isaac, thank you for joining us. And of course, everybody can check out Locked On College Basketball for more as we continue to cover everything for March Madness. Welcome back once again to our Final Four Bracket Breakdown Preview. I'm your host, Kainani Stevens. We have covered the men's Final Four. Now it is time to get to the women. Isabel Rodriguez here from Locked On Women's Basketball, Caroline Benton from Locked On LSU, and Andrew Lyon from Locked On Gamecocks. Isabel, I will start with you. Just in terms of individual performance, Caitlin Clark has been absolutely unconscious this tournament. Um, You know, that 41-point triple-double, insane. The amount of assists she's had as well, just she is like a one woman show, but obviously when you get to the final four, is that enough, especially when you're going up the, against the defending champs? Yeah. I mean, this is one thing that I think um, I've been wondering about Iowa for the past couple of games. Um, there've been some really interesting stats about how many points it's not even just like how many assists Caitlin Clark has, but it's how many points is she responsible for facilitating um, for Iowa? And it's often more than half. Um, and wow. so I think for me, the biggest question is with South Carolina being probably the top defensive team in the country, honestly, by a country mile at this point, um, is it going to be enough? And are they going to be able to find a way to make sure that she's not able to have those plays and to facilitate as much as she normally does? And in that case, where do they go next? I don't know. She's just she's amazing. But obviously, you know, we have to go to the team effort. South Carolina has stars galore they have wonderful coaching they have the pedigree they've been there before at this point you know they're obviously the favorite Andrew is there anyone besides themselves that can beat them at this point honestly I don't really think so and the main reason I say that is because I just think that South Carolina unlike probably the rest of the teams in the final four I just think they got too much depth South Carolina is a team that you can maybe beat for a 10 minute stretch. You can maybe even keep it close with them all the way up till halftime. But the thing about South Carolina that's most dangerous this year is they've got waves of personnel that they can throw at you in multiple various lineups. And Don Staley and her coaching staff have proven to be a really great team in terms of being able to make adjustments at halftime in some of these games. I think that the South Florida game from the round of 32 is a good example of that. I think that the Maryland game is a great example of that. Uh, I don't have exactly the score differential in front of me right now, but I know it's got to be at least 10 plus points in terms of those really tight games they've played from the majority of the season. So overall, I think that there are certainly teams that can challenge South Carolina, but beating them is an entirely different story. They've just looked so dominant um, thus far this season. So it's definitely going to be an interesting matchup with them against Iowa in that first round. Let's jump to the other matchup, Caroline. LSU in 2021, things were not very good. Kim Mulkey came to town, transfers come to town, Angel Reese comes to town. Now they're in the final four. Have you been impressed with how quickly that the program has been able to get to this point and, and what Kim's been able to do there? Yeah, that's really been the biggest storyline of this season is how quickly Kim Mulkey was able to come in and bring this program back to life. LSU women's basketball is not new to the Final Four. It's just been quite a long time. Um, Bob Starkey, who's in the locker room, who is kind of serving as an associate head coach, he was the head coach at LSU and coached some of the greatest women's basketball players of all time, much less women's basketball players at LSU, Simone Augustus, um, Sylvia Fowles, some of the greatest LSU basketball players uh, of all time. I mean, women's, yes, but just basketball players of all time. Mm -hmm. So he has that influence in the locker room. And then you also bring Kim Mulkey, who has this sort of unmatched energy and spunk and passion for the game. Everyone makes fun of the jackets and loves the jackets. And I think that that is just a, 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 a you know, a symbol of the kind of person and coach that Kim Mulkey is, that she is coming coming in with all sorts of energy and has breathed life into this program and has brought in so many transfers and so many pieces that are so talented, but haven't found that next step. We'll take Angel Reese, for example. She comes in from Maryland. She didn't quite get to the final stage that she wanted to be in. She comes into LSU. She just needed to find the right fit. And Kim Mulkey was that missing piece that needed to push all of this talent, Angel Reese included, and all the talent around them to really get to that next step. So the turnaround is 
something that is remarkable and something that we have to give Kim Lucky credit for. But I think that it is just the next step in a very storied history of Kim, of Kim Mulkey as a head coach. He just took the right head coach and the right pieces at the right time. And it all kind of feels like the perfect storm for this LSU women's basketball team that definitely has its flaws. Absolutely. But they've been able to come together when it matters most. And that's ultimately what has projected them to the final four. Pedigree is huge in women's basketball. And we know Kim Mulkey has that on her resume. So obviously she's helping LSU get back to where they have been previously. We're going to talk a little bit about Virginia Tech, Isabel. I feel like for a number one seed, they really don't get any play at all, right? Um, they, they're not a blue blood by name, right? They aren't always in the final four. They're not a UConn. They're not a South Carolina. They're not a Stanford. But how legit are the Hokies this year? What have they been able to do and, and just see their run to this final four? Look, this has been, they've been one of the most interesting teams to watch, I think, um, for, mm -hmm. for a couple of different reasons. I think Kenny Brooks has done a really good job with the pieces that he has on this team. Elizabeth Kitley in particular, she's the ACC player of the year um, for a reason. <laughs> she's one of the most dominant post players I've seen outside of Aaliyah Boston. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because they're able to spread the floor so well um, with their other guards, Georgia Moore in particular, um, it's really opened the door for her to do some really really awesome stuff down low and it, it makes defenses work really, really hard. <laughs> um, I mean, we saw this against Ohio state during their last game. I mean, Ohio state is one of those teams that will press the entire game. Um, but it just took Georgia and more basically sprinting from one end of the court to the other to open doors for them. And it was just, they play with so much energy and they play with so much passion um, that I think that it, combined with the talent that they have, how good of a coach Kenny Brooks is things just kind of folded in together for them. And it's been a really successful season. I mean, they had their first triple double in program history out of Georgia and more earlier this season. Um, and they're back in, I'm not even sure they've been to the final four before. Um, and so it's just been a really historic year for them. And to be honest, I, I have them going, I have them going to the final four <laughs> or okay. to the, to the national title game. Sorry. No, absolutely. I mean, and we love to see new teams, right? Because I mean, the, the, the different uh, programs are growing. We're getting more competition. It's only better for fans to watch. Isabel, you gave us a little bit of a preview. We're going to do predictions. So who do you have in the championship game? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, I've got South Carolina and Virginia Tech in the national title game. Um, I think it, it's actually pretty interesting that despite all of the chaos that went down, I mean, I basically have it down to two number one seeds, which mm -hmm. might be the most like classically women's basketball thing to happen maybe ever. <laughs> um uh, and yeah, I just think that South Carolina is too good um, to be stopped this year. Uh, I haven't seen it happen. Um, I think they are like a beatable team, but I don't think it's going to happen this year. I, there's just nobody else that's capable of doing what would be necessary to beat them, in my opinion. Fair. Andrew, I think I know who you're going to pick, but um, who do you think they're going to face? And uh, who maybe, who do you have for MVP? Is it going to be Leah Boston again? What are you thinking? I'm going to say that South Carolina is going to play LSU in the national title game. I'm going to give the nod to Kim Mulkey, who's got the experience in this moment. I think that Angel Reese is probably a top three player uh, in the country this year for women's college basketball. And if it weren't for Caitlin Clark and uh, Leah Boston, mm -hmm. they're dominant. She would get a lot more fanfare in uh, the national uh, media. But I think that South Carolina is still going to pull it off at the end. Angel Reese and Alexis Morris are two really good players. But again, I just think South Carolina's got too many bodies for them to contend with throughout a 40 minute basketball game. In terms of MVPs, I'll give you all a bit of a shocking pick. I'll go with Bree Beal. Bree Beal has been honestly the X factor for this team so far in this tournament. She's been really affecting the floor, both on the offensive and defensive ends. And I think that it could culminate into what could be an incredible championship game performance for her and what's been a very improved year for her, especially on the offensive end with her shooting prowess. So all in all, I still think South Carolina is going to pull it off in the end. But LSU, I think, will give them a test in the national title game. All right, Caroline, who do you have? Do you think Kim Mulkey can get back to the championship game and add another title to her resume? Well, I got to hold it down for my girls. I got to say, it's going to be a tough test against Virginia Tech. That's a name that Isabel mentioned that I am looking at to say that's going to be your number one job is limiting what Elizabeth can, Kitley can do offensively. LSU has struggled to produce offense. They've been very hot and cold offensively throughout the entire tournament. That Miami game was not a very fun watch if you're a fan <laughs> of offense, but that's what LSU does best is even if they don't have their best day offensively, they can just beat you up defensively. LSU is a very, very tough, very physical team. So I think that's ultimately gets them to the national championship. I'm going to agree with Andrew. I think it's going to be an SEC showdown. It just means more. 
LSU, South Carolina, Don Staley, Kim Mulkey, two of the best coaches, if not the best two coaches in women's basketball. And I'll go back to Super Bowl Sunday, which was my Super Bowl, South mm-hmm. Carolina, LSU women's basketball and South Carolina just dominated LSU. And I mm-hmm. watched that game and I said, look, I, I love my LSU Tigers, but that is a team yeah. that South Carolina team looks like a team that is un." beatable they are just that good so quick and so physical so I think ultimately South Carolina takes home another trophy I do think it might be interesting if it's a matchup between LSU and South Carolina what I'm predicting how much LSU can take away from that initial matchup with South Carolina earlier in the regular season have they taken some notes have they now seen what it takes to beat South Carolina and they can bring that into the national championship I think that may be an interesting um, curve thrown into things but ultimately, I mean, South Carolina is just such a good team from top to bottom. But I'm hoping my uh, my Tigers can bring it home in the end. All right. We'll have to watch to see, obviously, South Carolina. you got to beat the champs if you want to be the champs. And they have looked so good all year long. So it's going to take a huge effort to do that. Obviously, you can check in with all of our hosts, Locked On LSU, Locked On Gamecocks, Locked On Women's Basketball. We have you covered for all of the March Madness on the men's and women's side. And, of course, this is all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.